Julisha, welcome to Hatch Global. Um, it's another webinar with um, interesting people that we have. Um, today, we've got Dulisha Kulasuri, and I'll introduce him in just a second. Um, just Hatch Global is a com combination of many organizations that have got together to bring live streaming of uh, great individuals from around the world. Um, Hatch is a place for innovation, growth, and collaboration. It is a center of uh, gravity for all things startups. We build a space that encourages budding entrepreneurs to incubate, collaborate, and accelerate their businesses. Uh, from Bangladesh, we have BYLC Ventures, uh, which was created to help passionate young founders get kickstarted with their big ideas. They do this by providing technical support to validate a product or a solution and seed fund to go fast to market. Seed Ventures from Pakistan is a social entrepreneurship and equity development organization. They work to support and promote entrepreneurship across various landscapes and verticals. And we also have Pro Pakistani, which is Pakistan's largest independent publisher for tech, business, and other news with over 130 million traffic um, annually. Dulisha Kulasuriya, first of all, is a son of Sri Lanka, uh, an executive at uh, the Deloitte Center for Edge, Asia Pacific, uh, and he, part of the Global Management Research Institute exploring the edges of business and technology. Over the past decade, they've ex explored how the world is changing in very dramatic ways as results of evolving digital infrastructure and liberalization of public policy and its implementation to uh, individuals and institutions as well. Uh, Dulisha has researched and written and spoken extensively about dynamic ecosystems, including in this region, emerging business landscapes, rethinking the role of firm and individuals in form of institutional innovation, the future of work and about the relevances of edges, such as make a movement and sharing economy, trans tech and uh, many others. Uh, Dulisha, as I said, was born in Sri Lanka, studied and lived in the US for nearly three decades and recently relocated to Singapore with his wife and three beautiful children um, the boys and his cat and dog as well. So Dulisha, welcome to Hatch Global. Very good to be here, Nada. Thank you. Um, so firstly, you've been coming to this region so regularly and um, you decided to move to Singapore. Um, what made a difference in terms of why did you want to move to Singapore and what did you want to really feel in Singapore that you didn't feel because you were always on a flight to Asia anyway? Right. Um, so the move to Singapore is pre-COVID, right? It, the, the whole world has changed six, in the last six months. So it's kind of hard to imagine what life was like before that. Um, as you mentioned, I've been in the U.S. for a couple of decades and it's coming to Asia quite a bit. And it struck me at one point that I need to double down. This, this region is the one that's growing the fastest and I need to do more than dabble around and see things. I need to build much deeper networks. I need to gain new insights. And hopefully by doing that, I can connect it back to the world I know in the West and help accelerate things even further. The choice of Singapore uh, was that China is a bit over-indexed. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on in China. It's the one that's moving fastest in the region, but there's also a lot of people there. There's a lot that's known about China. Southeast Asia is the next one, right? It's, it's a sleeper. There's 700 million people in that region, in those 11 countries, and Singapore is in the center of that. And from a family standpoint, it's the easiest place to relocate. My wife is Singaporean, so it, it, it's easier for us to move back there. So that was our choice to kind of move to Singapore. But I must say, having been here, it is very different. In um, the US, for all of its faults, is very energetic. There's people who believe they can change the world and are at it every single day, particularly if you come from a hotspot like Silicon Valley. I mean, everywhere you go, someone's trying to change the world and they've got some idea. It might sound nonsensical, like, hey, dude, we're going to create a whole business on 42, 142 characters. But who knows? That's Twitter, right? So um, you don't find that in Singapore. It's different. And where does South Asia play uh, a role in this? Map? So let's see. Let's start. Let's start. Actually, let's let's double down a little bit on Singapore. Singapore is like a global 100 company. It's very well structured. It's efficient. It's got long-term planning. A very slow, measured, structured growth. 
There are very few moonshots, right? That's the difference from the US. Then let's talk about uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand as a block. Like those countries, they're much more unstructured. So you get pockets of entrepreneurial genius. But there's also some amount of like island culture, like, you know, hey, happy go lucky, it's good enough kind of thing. Not as much fire in the belly. Vietnam stands out a little bit for me. Um, maybe Myanmar, I'm not sure. It's part of their kind of political and religious heritage. They are much more driven, they're less politically divided, and they got more fire in the belly. Um, so there's differences in how each of these things are going to play out. Okay. Now, the region that we are talking here, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, I need to learn more. I mean, I know Sri Lanka, but the rest of the region, I need to learn more because I think there's a lot of hidden genius there. There's also a bunch of island culture too. I, I think you, we, we, you know Sri Lanka, so we'll get to show you a little bit of Bangladesh and, um, and Pakistan yeah. as well. Um, question for you. So, you know, with uh, COVID, um, a lot of things changed. Um, and you, you're a future, you predict a lot of things around the world for Deloitte, um, uh, specifically in business models, systems for in industries as well. Yeah. What changed in your prediction? Uh, and what's that massive shift that you've seen? So the world was already on a constant and accelerating growth path, right? For the last few decades, um, everything that's driven by these exponential technologies. But COVID-19 was a discontinuity. So it, it completely like stopped everything in its tracks and reset things. And it didn't reset it at the same way. Some things came to a full stop, few things slowed down, and some things are speeding up even more. So um, let's talk about what stopped physical contact. In order to slow down anything, to slow down kind of the growth of the pandemic made less physical contact. So that meant that you were forced to work from home. Your borders were closed, travel completely stopped. So some of those things are completely impossible. And so those industries were impacted a lot more. But uh, the underlying kind of engine that was driving the growth, these exponential technologies, they didn't slow down. So the definition of an exponential technology is the price performance curve. So over a period of time, the performance you get for the same price doubles. Right? It's usually six months, 18 months, whatever that curve, depending on what the technology is. That, the underlying technologies are still moving at the same pace because the core research, everything is gone. What's going to happen going forward is the adoption of those technologies are actually going to increase a lot more. These technologies allow us to do things with less human connection, less human touch. Um, and therefore, it's going to accelerate these things picking up. So some examples, um, who would have thought, I mean, a big part of Deloitte's business is audits, right? And part of audits is we do inventory audits. You do physical inventory and you go and do a sampling. Well, now we are testing how you do audits with drones and you'd fly the drone, uh, do images, uh, and, and just, and rather than just sampling a portion, you actually could do a full inventory. And you could do it, we realize you can do it better, faster, cheaper. That's not gonna change, because once you realize that you can do that, we want we a slow trajectory to try these things out. The forcing of this thing shut down means that it's gonna speed it up. Same thing with kind of workforce labor audits. You know, now it, it's harder and harder to go into factories to go into workplaces and do these audits we're using much more worker voice and looking at complaint lines and all that and the data that's collected the machine learning that comes from that, those is gonna pick up. So in many, many cases, the, the lack of being able to be there physically is gonna accelerate the adoption of technology. And um, you know, if you take the digital era, I mean, everybody's saying that because of COVID, We've got a five-year head start now because uh, 2025 is 2020 now because of what yeah. you just talked about. Uh, you know, people's adopt, uh, adoption of uh, technology is being much better. Um, what do you think the economic damage is because of this? I mean, obviously, you look look at Sri Lanka or any part of this region, or, or um, you know, tourism yeah. is a massive hit. Uh, you take uh, South Asia is a massive hub for apparel, and uh, apparel is taking a big hit as well. Um, so what, are, what do you see, feel the economic damages um, are going to be and, and what do you see 
um, as an economic uh, recovery uh, in, in which industry do you think that will happen? The economic uh, impact is going to be massive. It's going to be significant. And as you mentioned, it's, going to, it's not going to be spread equally, right? So some industries are going to be much harder than others. Um, like you mentioned, anything in travel and entertainment, anything in sports, anything with the events business, hospitality, international travel, um, consumer products, consumer like apparel and footwear. So those things are hit the hardest. And any of the economies that are dependent on those industries are gonna feel it much more than others. On the other end of the spectrum are the technology companies. So Apple, Microsoft, Google, um, these guys, even, even the Chinese ones, Tencent, Alibaba, their market caps have increased massively over the last six months because their technology is used a lot more, right? So if you are technology heavy, you do much better. Um, anything that, so in terms of recovery, I mean, government spending across the board is gonna go up. So any, anything that uses government spending will kind of increase over time. Um, power, energy is gonna shift fundamentally to a whole different, uh, there's gonna be a big shift in power and energy, decarbonization is accelerated. So those industries are gonna speed up quite a bit. So I think the economies that are gonna hit, hit hardest are gonna to have to rethink if they should start reinvesting in other, other industries that will kind of demarcate the future. And what do you think those industries are? Tech is a big one, but it, it's, it could be just localized tech, you know, um, maybe, for example, just the things like, um, we're gonna use less, less and less cash going forward. We're already using less, but you're gonna less and less because one, it starts from the fear of the pandemic, but as you start doing it, it becomes much more efficient. Um, healthcare, remote uh, healthcare, telemedicine, uh, for most routine stuff, rather than going to a hospital wasting time, you could just do it over your phone you know, with anyone over there. Um, so all of those things are gonna change, but every single one of those things are on digital infrastructure, right? So like there'll be, a, there'll be increased need for local tech um, capability as much as there's global need for it. The anything around sustainability and new energies is gonna get picked up. All of those fields are gonna, uh, the, that, that juggernaut was happening already for the last few years, ever since uh, Larry Fink, um, came and said that basically they're stepping away from all fossil fuels, all of these things uh, around climate change. It, the future money flows, all of that started slowing down. And they know that regulations are also changing around it. So now would be the time to double down on anything around sustainability on those fields. So if we can drive more attention to the kind of the future growth industries like tech and sustainable industries, the circular economy, um, new business models like co-ops or rebirth of new models, the rebirth of co-ops and stuff like that, that will help us be more resilient in the future. So, so moving on to, I mean, this week, uh, Jack Ma got replaced by Motang, uh, uh, Maho Tang, so by of 10 cents. So what, what you said about tech being more important is, is yep. coming through. Um, and you said something about co-op and business models. Um, what do you think are the business models of the future post-COVID is going to be? Is there uh, something that you, you're seeing in, in the Far East at all? Um, I'm not seeing it in the Far East. The, again, the discourse around the shift in business models has driven a lot more. There's been a lot of talk about kind of the winner takes all, right? The, the stuff that Arne Gildihar is talking about, and it's kind of like capitalism as it existed was starting to crumble. Right. And you found a lot of discourse around things like universal business, uh, universal um, basic income, right. and much more importantly, universal basic assets, things like that. So those, that, that really hadn't seeped down here. But if you think of, I mean, the co-op model, the cooperative model, where equity is shared among all of those who put in the labor, that is something that has to come back in a way. The, one of the greatest ills of today is growing inequality. And if you look at the long, you know, if you look at history, that level of inequality, it doesn't reset normally and naturally. It has only gotten reset by revolution. Right. So if you want to avoid that, we really have to take that head on 
and see how do we reduce kind of the wicked problem of, of things like social inequality. And, and just staying on the business model, yeah. I, I feel, as an individual, I feel that there is going to be some unlikely partnerships that are kind of come uh, across industries, um, uh, specifically in this new world where people are looking at uh, things very differently. I mean, all, everything from education is going to be different to yep. deliver things is going to be different. So there's going to be some unlikely partnerships. And, and, and could you predict a few unlikely partnerships that you think might happen? Yeah, the unlikely partnerships are going to come from the, for those who can reframe wicked problems into wicked opportunities. Right, so wicked problems are these intractable problems um, like inequality, like climate change, all that stuff. If you can reframe that in something completely different and talk about the opportunity if you did it different, if you had a fundamentally different healthcare system, if you had a fundamentally different education system, if you had a fundamentally different way of kind of a circular system around a consumer consumables and use it as a business model, build a business on that, um, they will lead the way. And in order to do that, they, are, they can't do it alone. So they are gonna have to kind of, it's the, the big companies of today coming together with entrepreneurs, coming together with kind of nonprofits, coming together with uh, support from governments that can actually make these things happen. So regulation plays a big way. It's, it's kind of the rebirth of public private partnerships and a re, rethinking of all of that. I'm trying to think of a good example. I mean, um, Elon Musk and SpaceX, I mean, who would think a private enterprise would be in space, right? It was, that was purely the domain of large nations, right? Until this happened now. And um, that's gonna open up a whole new, it has already opened up a whole new field on space. And actually uh, talking about space, Australia was never really in the space game. And about two years ago, they, they looked around the world and there's a particular ban because of all the weather patterns and geographical regions that you can launch to space. And a good portion of that ban is politically unsafe through kind of a lot of Africa and all that. And that's why Florida and a few other US places are the only place you can launch to space from. And the Northern part of Australia is actually really uh, amenable for space launches. Right. So they decided to do an Australia, kind of Australian space industry. And right. just in the space of a few years, they've managed to bring tons of startups, tons of money, uh, tons of research all in one place to build a whole new industry that didn't even exist. I mean, most corporates um, around this region and, and, and around uh, the world are letting go of people. They're looking yeah. for the line items uh, that they need to remove from their uh, businesses. Um, so the usual ones that are cut are marketing costs, media costs. Yeah. And the interesting one that's, that really does fathoms me is they cut out innovation. Um, in this whole world, um, mm -hmm. I feel that innovation is probably needs to be the one that needs to be invested in. More. Yes. What are your views on that? Yeah, innovation is what we need much more than anything else. Innovation and entrepreneurship, both, right? So for large corporations, innovation. For um, individuals and small ones, it's entrepreneurship. Uh, so going back to the social inequality, the, the biggest thing to change so, uh, social inequality is to cre increase social mobility. Right, how you can start, you might be born to a particular class, but the, your ability to move up and down. In the past, you could do that through education, right? In our, in our parents and grandparents, like an education guaranteed you social mobility. If you studied really got that. That's no longer a guarantee anymore, right? We, we've gone way past that. Um, you could marry into it. You know, that's another way to have social mobility. You marry up. Uh, the other one was entrepreneurship or business, right? You, you actually start something and you grow the business and you do that. But those are all stacked towards others. If you can have a vibrant ecosystem that drives a lot more entrepreneurship, that allows for more people to make it up, right? So that's one way to kind of drive more social mobility. Um, and from a large company standpoint, innovation is how you grow. I mean, it's the only... If not, you're just going to be battling and battling to, to get a 
keep your share or smaller share of a shrinking kind of uh, pie. Innovation is how you grow the pie. Innovation is how you like discover new pies. And how do you sort of, um, uh, you know, I agree completely with you with regard to entrepreneurship and you, your, you know, everyone yeah. who's joined in, in today is an entrepreneur. So guys out there, please uh, put down your questions either on your the Facebook uh, page or on uh, the, uh, the Zoom link on the chat and we'll take this up. Let's say where you're from and, and what your question is. I'd uh, love to take some questions in a little while. Um, so a lot of people on, the, on this um, listening to you today are entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah. And always use this term, uh, wicked problems and social inequality as yeah. well. Um, so in, in defining a, a sort of wicked problems in South Asia, um, one of the biggest one is social inequality. And, and secondly, um, how, you know, the problems um, are, you know, the richer got richer and the, the yeah. poorer got poorer, right? So how, how do you address this from an entrepreneurial way when you're at the bottom of the pyramid? Um, I mean, you, you have to create entrepreneurial activity and entrepreneurial opportunities at every level, right? Uh -huh. And that goes from, so in Indonesia, there's a company called Warung Pinta. And Warung Pinta takes the warungs, which is your kind of bodega, your corner shop, or the, the, in Sri Lanka where you get the little kade in every uh, gama, you take that, but they've created, it's like an all-in-one kind of thing that they, it's all in one box that they brought online. These things are completely gray market, but instead this thing is connected with a POS system, has refrigeration, has lighting, has charging for phones. But for the, so for the first time now, you have an idea of inventory going into these things, how it's moving and all that. So it allows for the big guys to kind of send inventory and in, be much more efficient. Those savings can be allowed for these guys to be much more efficient in what they do, right? So that is a very low grade thing. Another company we're working with uh, is in Malaysia. They are making, uh, they've come up with a new technology for building material. Um, it, it's Kanaf. Kanaf is uh, what, it, what you call in Sri Lanka, Hana, uh, the plant. And uh, we use it generally to make the, the Hana bags, right? The bags and all that stuff. Uh, so Kanaf is the version of hemp in, in the Southern hemisphere. And it's like hempcrete. So you can take the, the fibers from Kanaf and make it into concrete, a concrete replacement. Right. So these guys have come up with the technology and they're building very affordable homes, but it's a very easy, it's like people can basically, a small family can get together. It's a small whole business that so they can build bricks out of this and build their own homes, start a business, sell it to others. So there's all kinds of, you can grow it as a crop instead of tobacco or something else. You can sell the high-end fibers to the likes of Toyota, the low end stuff to build this concrete. It's an animal feed. You can build a whole business around this one plant. Mm -hmm. So one idea is providing more things at every range in the, in the stack, right? Because employment is great, but if you focus on employment, when an industry shifts like it does now, all those people suddenly become unemployed. So you get big shocks. Entrepreneurship is much more sustainable. The shocks are much lighter and the skills that you gain by being an entrepreneur helps you restart much, much easier than being an employed. When you're employed, you, you learn to take orders and to follow orders really well, right? That's not a life skill that's going to last you as well as being an entrepreneur. So if we can stack layers of entrepreneurship, everything from the small thing to the big ones, not just the startup ideas, even those kind of um, very local ones, very non-tech ones, that'll go a long way for a country to be more resilient. Um, so if you were looking at, you, know, you spoke about the country and, and then you spoke about all the opportunities and you've talked about the corporates and the individuals, what's yeah. the role of government and what's the role of regulation? Because a lot of the times things don't happen because you know, the government today, for example, in, yeah. in some Asia, a lot of the government is saying, okay, we're going to ban imports because, you know, we want to have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a balance of better a balance of payment. But suddenly when all these entrepreneurs go and invest in businesses, suddenly, uh, you know, the, the closed economy becomes open again and they're in trouble. So what's the role the government really needs to play? Because it's a, a chicken and egg situation. You do want to have the modernism coming in, but at the same time, yeah. you do want 
have uh, and fend for yourself? Well, I think there's two roles of government um, fundamentally. I mean, one is in regulation. I'll go through some examples of potential regulations that can help. And the second is in kind of government funds, where the money they spend, where it goes. So in terms of regulation, um, there's a lot of regulation you can put in place to encourage more entrepreneurship, like tax breaks for entrepreneurship, uh, zoning for entrepreneurship. Like there's a lot of stuff that you can allow for more entrepreneurs. Right. You know, uh, loans, uh, financing, you know, so there's a lot of regulation for entrepreneurship. There's uh, regulation to increase social mobility, which is kind of measured actions around affirmative action. That certain classes, the ones who are getting the least, uh, have inroads into either entrepreneurial and if not into employment, at least. So that they get trained, right? It's the same as what we do with our education system that if you're from a particular uh, part of the country, you hit a lower score to get into university, right? But it gives you a leg up because there's a, a disadvantage and stuff, right? That kind of uh, social, mobility, like affirmative action in very measured ways to get them into, to get trained more. So that's another one. Uh, regulation to support more things like co-ops and shared equity models, like allowing them, giving them tax breaks in such a way that more people would be willing to do shared equity so that wealth is distributed uh, than wealth going to a winner take all and stacking up to those who have more, right? Uh, and regulation to reduce negative externalities that eventually the local communities and governments are to pay for, like pollution, destruction, natural resources. You can regulate against those things so that you're not taking the burden or the local community or the government isn't taking on the burden. So that's on the regulation side. Yes, you can do some trade regulation, but I am not a huge fan of that. I think um, you're better off building your local capability and encouraging the local capability rather than holding off or building artificial barriers. You might have to put some artificial barriers to encourage the local stuff to pick up, but I think it has to be short term, if anything. The, the second piece is where they put their money. So recessions like the World War and, and uh, other recessionary times, that's when most of the infrastructure in the world is built highways, bridges, parks, a lot of this built in recession times because governments are throwing a lot of money to essentially create jobs and keep people busy, but right? they kept the economy going. The new infrastructure we need is digital infrastructure, platform infrastructure, business infrastructure. So they should be putting money to building those things up. If there is a really good, if, like imagine if there was an Etsy-like platform that allows for buyers and sellers to find each other for whatever it is, right? or eBay like for any, if there was a government led platform that allowed for more transparency in our food supply chain, in any supply chain around the country, that would be massively beneficial for the small guy. Because a small guy can find big markets through that. Right. So if they could put money towards building this infrastructure, one, you're creating jobs that are useful and you're creating training that's useful. Two, you're allowing the small people to get a leg up and to play with the big guys. And, and then just staying on that, I mean, a lot of the large tech companies like Facebook and, um, yeah. uh, Apple and, and Amazon um, versus the, the, the minors in terms of the smaller, you know, the, the, the corner shop that you spoke about. Um, and then you look at, um, you know, the, the, the larger companies are getting larger and, and, and smaller companies are not getting an opportunity because of that. So, so how do you balance that out with regulation as well? Um, so it depends on the company, right? Like if you think of rather than the, the, the US techies, if you think of like Alibaba and Pinduoduo, the Chinese ones, right? They created so much opportunity. So much of rural China came out of poverty because of these large companies giving access, whether it's factories, small scale factories, craft, all kinds of jobs that were created in middle of nowhere China. Because, because they were the platforms that connected that. And now those same platforms are being extended to the Belt and Road all across the world to Africa. New markets, new ways, new everything. So yes, they are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger, but at the same point, they're they are also lifting the bottom up, right? So that to me seems better than some of the other you know industries or other companies that are 
definitely winner take all and the distribution is not supporting um, the, the population. But there has to be more regulation around corporate taxes and corporate loopholes and stuff like that. And um, I mean, right now, uh, I think Denmark and a few other countries said that they will not bail out any countries that have offshore accounting, right. any companies that have offshore accounting. Right? So companies are taking stronger stakes in terms of closing out some of these loopholes. I mean, having said that, the US, a lot of the large companies pay much less taxes than they likely should because they, they also have the most access to find those loopholes. So there has to be better regulation and distribution on that. But you could, but that's, that's a fight rather than doing that. If you drive them towards affirmative action, right? Every new building has to be green. Every new building, every new kind of a certain percentage of employees have to be from these categories. You have to commit to give so much back to the community that you're in. Like things like that are more digestible and an easier transition than trying to change your tax structure overnight. And, and you know, when you look back and then you look at the different revolutions, um, you know, we're in the digital revolution, right? So yeah. most countries in South Asia are still thinking of putting infrastructure down, whether it's building ports or, or roadways or, um, you know, heavy duty bridges, et cetera. So, uh, compared to that, you know, should they be investing more in digital infrastructure at this point? Um, no, because they, they need the basics first, right? You, you need to have, you need to have a road system uh, to, to move stuff around. You need to have those basics first before you, at the same time, I wouldn't say first. You need to have the basics at the same time you do the digital stuff. So I don't, I don't think it's an either or. I think we have to at least get to a basic level um, to be in parity with the next tier of countries that we would be kind of um, either competing with or an expectation of kind of the the population. And at the same time, we need to double down on our digital infrastructure. So I, I don't think we can slow down on some of the, the infrastructure that's been behind for decades, but it, we can't wait for that to be done for the digital infrastructure to start either. And how have you found the digital infrastructure in uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia uh, to be so far? Pretty poor other than for mobile, uh, which kind of leapfrogged, that's the one infrastructure that has done reasonably well, but everything else is pretty poor. I mean, Singapore is an exception. Singapore is you know, very good on that. But most of the rest of the region is still very far behind in the digital infrastructure, right? So they, they need, you need kind of the basic of the pipes in the ground and the lines and everything, unless you're gonna do some fundamentally different way to connect the world, you need connectivity. That's the number one thing. Once you have connectivity, um, whether you go to 5G or something else may or not make a difference, then, then you can build kind of the layers of the platform. That, that you know take advantage of the connectivity. But you need to put in that connectivity first in order to lift everyone up. And, and we, we spoke a little earlier about the food and energy and how that's become very important yeah. uh, part of the world. And, and uh, what, what are you seeing uh, that's still lacking in food and energy in this part of the region? Um, a lot, and so, so energy wise, we, uh, we really, as a region, should make the shift over to sustainable energies, to new energies. Uh, we need to make those investments because that is where the world, I mean, you know the, the, the quote from ice hockey, right? You got to skate to where the puck is, not you know, where it's going to be, not where it is. So we know the puck's going to be there. We got to get there. If we stay what you're doing now, we're just going to get more and more behind this. And if we build the kind of talent to build those things, one, it's going to provide jobs. Two, that talent can go elsewhere and support other projects as well in the rest of the world, right? So we, we need to do that. On the food stuff, I mean, this is a really fertile region. We, we used to export to the world. 
we've stopped doing that. We can do that again, right? And we can be much smarter in how we do that in terms of we can use technology to do better irrigation. We can use technology to use less chemicals. I mean, there's so much more available to kind of redo that. And we can reduce a lot of wastage if you use technology to have better supply chains, more efficient supply chains. Right? If you have more price transparency, there's a lot we can do to improve on all of that driven purely by technology. And um, if, you, if you go on to energy, I mean, uh, yeah. Coal has become cheaper, oil has become cheaper um, pre-COVID and post-COVID as well. Um, so, so the first thing the governments are doing to look at energy is going for the cheapest option. So yep. how do you uh, determine a, a, a strategy based on sustainability when you know, you've got other problems in the econo economy that's uh, affecting it? And this is what keeps the, the inequality, the global inequality the same, right? So if you look at the biggest companies, BP and Shell, have both come out and said by 2050 they're going to be carbon neutral. They're, going to, they're basically stepping out of their business. They were going to they were going to be 50 percent carbon neutral by uh, by 2050. They just they're going to be 100 percent, right? I mean, they they are all. If the biggest guys in the business are getting out of it, if all the regulation is getting out of it, we are going to be the ones like paying for whatever's left, right? It's it's like we got to get ahead of this and we have to find ways to leapfrog. We have to figure out ways to, to um, double down. And it could be things like, like I said, the micro hydroelectric, not the big hydroelectric, but how do you do it at very small scales? It could be, I mean, solar cost has been coming on exponentially, right? Could we do more with solar? Could we do more with thermal? I mean, our countries have a lot of natural resources that we likely haven't tapped into. And let, I mean, look for global largesse, uh, the nonprofits or UN system to support funding those things, if we can do it ourselves. Uh, and um, you, you spoke a little bit about supply chain. Um, yeah. uh, has supply chain being disrupted due to this and does it need to be reconfigured? Global supply chains are absolutely going to get reconfigured. Um, they're going to get shorter. They're going to get more, more flexible, uh, essentially more resilient, right? In, in anticipation of future shocks. Um, all of these countries have come to realize that. Uh, and so uh, like the likes of Australia and the US realized that over the last few decades, they pretty much gave up most of their manufacturing cap capability to Asia. And that left them really vulnerable in many cases. So they are now looking to see how they could reshore some of that. And all of the reshoring is going to be very, very tech heavy. Smart right. factories, all the new technologies because labor costs are high in those two places, right? And that's going to be the case everywhere. Everyone's going to look to have um, shorter supply chains driven by um, technology and more flexibility that if they need to shift from one, one to another that they can, whether they're shifting from one, one buyer, one market to another, or whether they're shifting from one kind of product of um, ingredient to another. So there's gonna be a lot more shortening and a lot more um, uh, onshoring going on here. And for the regions like ours that were kind of supplying or producing and manufacturing for the rest of the world, that has big implications. So we had to find um, new markets, which in the growth in all of these places is actually Southeast Asia, right? Southeast Asia, China, and Africa is where the growth in populations, the growth of, growth of consu uh, consumption in the future. So those are the markets we need to be looking at and much more just circular within our own countries. And, and, and that's a big massive uh, Achilles heel in South Asia is that the reliance on the European market, uh, yes. trade um, uh, opportunities as well as the US market just to the sheer volume. Yeah. They've never taken a look and said, oh, you know, I can actually probably sell something to Thailand or Indonesia or Singapore uh, as an opportunity because the markets are much smaller. Um, so how do you sort of reconfigure yourself to be selling more to the Far East uh, than to the Western world? Um, that's a tough one, but I think the answer in, in some part lies in technology and transparency that if you have platforms that make it agnostic as to where it comes from, that the quality is right, 
and uh, it hits a price point, uh, you can do that. But we have to spend some kind of political capital. We had to spend some energy into kind of building these connections and building these markets uh, because we've been so reliant on a few markets to drive us. And we didn't think that was going to change as fast as it did. As it did. Um, you look at uh, the next frontier of innovation um, and specifically the ecosystem of innovation. Um, how do you really go out there and implement this? Uh, who are the stakeholders? What do private organizations do and what can individuals do um, in, in this space? Yeah, and that goes back to that whole thing I said, the, the, the new kind of public-private partnership. Like, so let's say um, any of our governments decide that they want to put in um, a, a supply chain platform, a countrywide supply chain platform. They obviously, they can fund it, they can put money towards it, but that's about it, right? They can't really do much more about it. So you need some big guys with the capability to come in to sign up to say that they will be part of this, that they will be feeding it. So they, they put their assets and they put their kind of inventory, they put their work into it. But most of the technology will be niche um, startups who have little bits of the technology that can come together to stitch it all together, right, to, to make this work. So that's a fabric where all of this could come together and build something for the country that also in, ends up individually uh, supporting and building up both the startups, the large companies, and supporting the, the country and therefore the government as well. So that's an example of how these ecosystems could work. So in Singapore, we're working on this on three domains. One is uh, to be more food secure. Right now, Singapore uh, produces 6% of its own food. They're trying to get to 30%. And so this goes everything from urban farming to uh, supply chains to less food wastage, all of that stuff, uh, lab-grown meat, the whole end, end to end, right? So we're building an ecosystem of public, private, like the large guys, like the Mars, Dole, all of those guys, uh, the public entities, as well as startups to come together to solve for that problem. We are looking at uh, new energies, like again, decarbonization, electrifying, all of that stuff. Uh, again, creating an ecosystem approach to doing that. So you can get to microgrids, all of the different technologies that would go to do this transition, rather than it being just uh, public led or a few company led, bringing in everyone together for that. And the third one is uh, plastic waste. Because Southeast Asia is the largest producer of plastic waste. And I mean, if you think of plastic waste, there's so many things. You can, you can have different non-plastic materials. You can have biodegradable plastics, like those ones made from cassava. You can create waste collection systems that have nothing to do with technology, just collection systems. You can create uh, markets for recyclables and all that. So there's so many ways that you could come together to solve for that problem. And again, creating ecosystems where all of the big guys, in that case, Unilever, Cargill, Dole, Mars, all want to be part of that ecosystem, along with a, small, a bunch of small companies and researchers who have the technology to make it work and the funding from the government, right? So those are examples that we are, we are, we are kind of working through in Singapore, but any one of the other countries, uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, could be doing all of the same as well. I mean, robotics is a, is a big part of that as well, right? So, you know, Singapore, yep specifically as uh, uh, many programs to help robotics. So whilst on one side you're trying to create jobs and you're trying to create ecosystems um, and innovate, also on the other side, innovation is taking away jobs is the view that a lot of um, Asians have. So what is your view on uh, uh, robots taking human jobs? Yeah, I mean, with robots, you'll always say it's not about replacement, but, but, but augmentation, right? So that's, it's, a, it's a quip saying it doesn't always count. Um, but in many cases, it is, it is that, right? It's, it's like you can help uh, one person do kind of four or five jobs or do their job more efficiently. Now, the right thing to match with robotics would be if you're becoming more efficient uh, from a social standpoint, would then therefore say you get paid the same and you work less hours, right? Go with the French model saying no more than 40 hours a week. Yeah. Right. If, if you so if, if you can give it back in that sense, then you have uh, a better social contract where life gets better because robots can help you get more efficient. If the efficiency from robots ends up supporting a few companies making more money, 
and using less labor, creating less jobs, uh, creating more wealth for themselves and not distributing it, that's not going to be good in the long term. So uh, technology has to be matched with social policies and social norms that would hopefully make life better for many more than make it better for a few. I mean, I've always believed that uh, probably uh, um, with COVID, certain things have got um, uh, readjusted specifically when you look at space, uh, how people are working from offices, how technology is being used, like what we're doing now. Um, and there creates an opportunity because I think having an employee with, with four days of high efficiency rather yep. than giving them three days off is a, is a much better way of getting around um, efficiencies and fatigue uh, and also this whole thing about automation as well. Yeah. I mean, if you can come to a point where you only care about the work that gets done um, as opposed to where you work from or how you work or any of that, if you can be a lot, if you can provide a more flexibility in how work is done, you'll find that people are much happier. It ha you had to have autonomy in that flexibility. If that flexibility is forced upon you and it automatically comes with a, a less capacity to earn money, that is not a great option. Right? It, it, that, that provides flexibility for the company, not for the individual. Right? It, it has to work for the individual as well, that they have autonomy to do the work that they can, in, that they need to, in a more flexible manner to, to match their needs. But one thing we're going to see from... Um, and this is more relevant to kind of more congested cities. One thing we're gonna see is, so this, this experiment we went through working from home for all the white collar workers in, in the last six months or three months, it's the largest, world's largest experiment of remote working ever. Right. It's stuff that we said you could never do. Places that are very high uh, kind of cultural context, Indonesia, Vietnam, and even Singapore, like completely shut down, right? You could literally could not go to work. And the world didn't shut down. They kept working. It worked. So the new ways of working actually worked. So it is going to change. But in a lot of these cities, like the Manilas, the Bangkoks, even Singapore, Hong Kong, our homes are not built to be home offices. There's not enough space. Uh, there's kids running around. Uh, it, it, you can't take a call. It's it's not the right environment to do work. But coming out of this, you also don't want to be having an hour and a half commute anymore because you know that you can do the work elsewhere. So we believe there'll be a new, uh, a whole new genre of work near home spaces. So it's kind of the we work, but much, much lower grade co-working space, very simple, good infrastructure in terms of security, privacy, uh, connectivity, all that stuff, but you can get away from your home. You go a mile or two at most. You can work from there when you need to, and you go back, but you don't have to go to CBD. You don't have to go to the, the central business district. Your company can reduce its high, uh, high cost rent and spread it across around. So we're gonna see a new ring of work near home centers particularly in places like Bangkok, Manila, Jakarta, where traffic is a massive, massive issue. So what are the, what's going to happen to the likes of WeWorks and, and other co-working spaces? Um, they'll still be there, but they're catering to a different crowd. They're catering to kind of innovation hubs. They're catering to uh, better funded NGOs. They're catering to entrepreneurs and startups. I mean, they'll still be there because there's a need to be central in those things. There's a need to co-locate. This is kind of getting basic work done. This is for the general worker who needs to get work done, but they don't have a good environment at home to do it. Right. And they shouldn't be commuting an hour and a half to go to a high rent uh, space in the central business district. Just moving on to funding. So you have uh, yeah. banks, you have um, you know, DFIs, you have private equity, you have venture capital. With all of this changing around us, What's the behavioral changes that we need to see from these guys? We need more chamats. Right? I mean, I mean chamat is very outspoken in saying how that whole industry needs to change and shift. Um, Funding is going to be much harder. 
The good thing, uh, at least we're seeing this in climate change, right? starting with Larry Fink and some of the bigger funds shifting away from kind of moving much more to sustainable, pushing that. Ideally, and hopefully, we will see them also pushing towards social good as well. Right. If they start doing that, if future financing flows start pushing for better labor regulations, better uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion, uh, better in terms of worker care, or if, if they start pushing for those things, it'll fundamentally change the whole game. But I don't know who's going to start that revolution. Maybe Chama. I mean, he's already started. But yes. um, somebody big has to step up and make a move. And it's interesting you say that. So uh, I think that um, impact investing is going to be the forefront of some of this stuff in Southeast Asia and South yeah. Asia. Um, uh, and I think from more of venture world, I think there's the, the private equity guys are going towards more of a venture world as well. And the venture capitalists are going towards more of an impact world as well. So um, I, I already see the shift in this, uh, this as well. And, and, and interestingly, what you were saying about the, 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 the lack of um, uh, the pyramid being flattened out is an opportunity for all of this funding to go in and do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let, one thing that you said was about education. I think in the past, um, you know, you were looking at social um, yeah, mobility as being more, you know, education being one of the key things. Um, Education is changing, right? So you have these um, universities, and I call them expensive university, but very good education um, is being also changed uh, in, yeah. in the way that you're going to deliver lectures and stuff. What are the skill sets that you think you would advise for entrepreneurs to learn today to be able to manage the future? So the education we need the most are life skills. Right? It's what the entrepreneurs learn along the way as they do it, right? It's the learning to hustle. It's the learning to, to have grit. It's the learning to learn. Because the technical skills that we move to in the rest of the world to get to the, the educational degrees, a lot of what, what is technical is going to get taken over by computers. Computers over time and ro computers, robots, machines, AI, uh, software, they will be able to do all of that much better, faster, cheaper than humans will. So those things are like, they're very valuable now, but they won't be for very long. You know, it'll be a decade. It definitely won't be for our kids. So if, if you can learn to relearn, if you can learn the fundamentals, you know, in some ways it's going back to history, uh, sociology, um, philosophy and all that, that, that's kind of on the high end of kind of learning to learn and learning to think and all of that. That is great if you have a society that values more leisure time. It, but you also need to take that stuff and it's kind of the different bit, difference between invention and innovation. Invention is being able to do something maybe for the first time. Innovation is taking that and being able to kind of put it into a business model and scale it to make money off it, right? So the philosophy, sociology, history, all of that, that's on the invention side. The, the kind of the core building blocks of how to think and how to think differently. The Innovation side is where we need the creativity, the entrepreneurship. That's where it comes to play, as where it can build and help and grow and scale to support many more people. But those are the building blocks of what we need to learn for the future. It's kind of the ability to be resilient. Um, it, it, those are skills. So we, we wrote a paper called Unlocking Human Potential a while ago, and we talk about uh, practices that are individual needs. And we, we said there are practices that ground you so that you can deal with the tough things and that's around community, having a sense of self, knowing what your values are, being deeply connected to something, being rooted, being grounded so that when you get hit with a shock, you have a way to dissipate it. But the other part of the shoots, how do you grow? How do you explore? How do you learn new things, right? And that you need to build these things continuously in order to grow. And your unlearning and relearning happens through building those practices. So you gotta be taking on fields that you have no idea about. You've got to be learning new things. You've got to be putting yourself in uncomfortable positions because that's where you learn. 
Like you got to keep stretching yourself at the same point that you build your kind of roots. So those are the things that we should be teaching more of as fundamentals. And on top of that, you should have a layer of technical skills that allow you to do certain jobs. Right. And, and, and um, when you look at um, education as a whole and, and you look at um, education um, for you know, kids under 10 and kids under 15, what fundamentally has to change for them? Cool. So kids under 10 is absolutely the foundation of like how to be a good human being, logic, structure. I mean, what we realized in the last three, four months of having a 10 year old, two, six year olds at home is there's not a lot of content that they learn. Not a lot at all. I mean, it's literally an hour or two of work. They're learning reading, writing, logic. Right. I mean, that's it, right? But so you can learn that and more like emotional stuff that the emotional regulation, how to work with others, uh, how to like uh, think and think differently, how to be creative, imagination, like those are the skills that you really need to anchor at a very young age, along with reading, writing, like, you know, the basic things to communicate, right? how to communicate ideas, how to develop ideas, how to frame ideas, all of that stuff. Um, so education fundamentally has to change all the way. And just like work, it can be so much more fun and meaningful and tailored to an individual if we were willing to rethink it. Right. But like everything else, we are stuck in systems and it's very hard to be the one who gets out of a system because everyone, including your parents, will tell you what you're going to risk your kid's education to this new thing. You, you can't do that. Anything new is very dangerous. Right. It's no different from interracial marriages when it first happened. It's no different from kind of the LGBT thing when it became like anything different is no, you can't do that, right? It's, it's true, you can't risk it. So we, do, we, we perpetuate these systems upon our kids by saying, well, it, it's the best we have. Right. And so it's a risk of not doing what's not. So we personally are very keen on uh, looking into unlearning and you know, even thinking that if we have enough families to set up a new school like the Green School in Bali right. uh, and fundamentally rethink what it could be, but we also recognize that comes out of privilege, that comes out of access, and you know, at least in its current form, won't scale. Um, just uh, could you just ex uh, expand on the Green School in Bali a little? So the Green School in Bali, I think his name is John um, Daly, who started it. He uh, he's an American who ended up in Bali. I'm not sure his whole story, but it is built all around nature. And the school and everything is built into nature. It's all built, it's all bamboo structures, beautiful place. And all of the instruction is done in projects in nature. Right. And you realize that you can teach kids so many more things, but in a, in a, in a way that they, uh, they, they embed in who they are and what they do, as opposed to rote memory and instruction. Right? So it's, it's a very different way of teaching, but I mean, it, fundamentally, it's a private school and a not cheap private school. So if you can create more scalable models of that, that would be excellent. So it's the adult version of your favorite place in the world, which is Burning Man. <laughs> yes, it is kind of the adult version of Burning Man. We need more Burning Mans too. But I mean, if you're looking at education, uh, Minerva University, which came out of San Francisco, is a really good example. Uh, they're reinventing uh, higher education. Right. Uh, so it's a liberal arts education of all the things I talked about, like that's what they're focusing on. But they do a few things. Uh, uh, so Ben uh, Ben Nelson, who started it, is, is a good friend. He um, he fundamentally, he looked at all the economics of what it takes to run a school. And he right. said, these are all the things, these are all the costs that don't matter anymore. So they don't have any sports programs, right. no athletics. They don't have any infrastructure, no buildings, no campuses, nothing, none of that stuff. They don't have any tenured professors. And um, so they, they took out all of those big costs and instead they rent the space they need in the city. Right. Um, they are in seven cities because every semester the whole class moves to a new city. Right. So they start in San Francisco, they end in San Francisco. 
in between, they go to Rio, to London, to, uh, to Korea, to, they go to seven different cities, to Mumbai, and the whole class spends a semester there. Mm. All the work is done by the kids, and you, know, you, you do all your reading and textbooks at home, and you come into the classroom to do group work, to mm. learn from each other, to do what you do. So they completely flip the whole system around. Right. And he can offer that at a third of the cost of a normal, a comparable liberal arts school. Right. But will it scale? I don't know. But he's fundamentally rethinking the whole system. I, I suppose it's like the universities, like in Seattle and, and Stanford, having uh, different parts in you know the Europe, uh, you, you, Europe, China, and Singapore as well. Um, we're just coming to the end of uh, the session, Delicia. So, a couple of questions. One yeah. is if you if you had um, to bet on three things that will change, what would those three things be? In what domain? In today's uh, um, uh, industry, what, what do you think are the three things that would change in any of the industries that you're looking at today? Because so I think um, energy is fundamentally reshifted. Decarbonization is on its way. Right. So energy is fundamentally reshifted towards that. Um, technology got a big boost so anything cloud and all the platforms upon that massive boost so anything uh, cash is going to go down cashless is picking up um, so every institution that is built on the old world is going to have a harder time the institutions that are built on the new world on technology uh, are doing well are going to do much better the rest is going to be, you're going to see um, the world bifurcate. Right. Some countries are going to open up even more and be able to attract the best of the best and attract more people to come. Other countries are going to shut down their borders even, even more, become more nationalistic and slow down even more. So you're going to see not, not, the world is not going to go in one direction. It's going to bifurcate in different ways. Um, the same thing, you, so, so politics are gonna buy forget a lot. Um, social policies are gonna buy forget a lot for the same reason. So those things are gonna you know, buy forget rather than congregate into one. Right. Good answer. Um, and the, one final question for you. If you had a million dollars today, what business would you put it in? Depends what I wanna gain from it. Um, I would put it in to build, to build a showcase model for a sustainable small farm, a multimodal small farm permaculture, eco-tourism kind of thing uh, to showcase what it could be so that others could replicate it as well. Delisha, thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, as usual for your thought-provoking ideas and uh, it's always a pleasure to speak to you because you know I, every minute I speak to you, I learn something new, and uh, it's it's great to have you on your program and uh, on the program. And I I invite you to visit um, any of the South Asian countries. We'd love to have you um, visit um, and and see what you can um, teach us from what you're learning in Southeast Asia to South Asia as well. So thank you very much for taking time to meet us and. Um, I want to just also thank Hatch, BYRC Ventures, Seed Ventures, and Pro Pakistani for hosting us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dulisha. If you've got any last words, this is the time to say it. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Uh, a big reason I moved back was to spend more time in the region and personally to spend more time in Sri Lanka and uh, bring the kids there, have us to have them understand my home country better. And unfortunately, COVID has slowed that down. Um, I absolutely want to do more projects in Sri Lanka and uh, the region around Pakistan, Bangladesh, all of that. So as um, soon as things open up or even before that, I'd love to get involved in any project, support anyone uh, doing good, anyone who can help reduce inequality, anyone who can help increase more social mobility, any of the ideas, if, if I said today, caught interest. Uh, feel free to ping me. It might take me a while to get back. I'm a little swamped right now, but uh, very open to uh, dulish at gmail.com. That's my email. Uh, send me a note. Uh, find me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, friend me and 
would love to start the conversation. I, I want to do more. I want to put these into practice. Thank you very much, Alicia. And I know it's very late for you, so I really appreciate you taking this. Uh, and uh, good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye.